Hi everybody, I'm Paula with the Atlantic Institute. This is a, our cuisine of different cultures and we are going to have Natalie show us what we're gonna be making today in a little bit. But first, um, I'm gonna show you a two minute video on the Atlantic Institute. Um, we are a nonprofit that promotes positive dialogue between different cultures, races, religions, just having positive dialogue. And so, um, with that being said, I forgot to bring that video up ahead of time. I am going to show it to you here in just a second. This um, is my pendant light. I and this is my spatula. It's also my like fair. It does. Hang on just a second. I apologize. All right, I'm going to share my screen now. Nobody else waiting to get in. Um, while you're waiting for this, if you could put where you're from in the chat, that would be awesome. What we do is we do something called an event audit where um, we show the bosses where we're, where people are coming from to view our, our programs and by showing that we are hitting worldwide um, I can do more and more of these programs. So that's that's the only reason I ask why. It's, it's just showing the bosses that this is a worthy thing to do and to continue doing them virtually versus only in person, which is what we used to do three years ago before COVID. So um, if you could just share that information, I appreciate it. And I see the chats going in there and I pre thank you very much. All right, I am now gonna share this video with you. The Atlantic Institute is a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting harmonious coexistence between peoples of various cultures, faiths, and backgrounds. We seek this goal through peaceful dialogue, education initiatives, and community organization. Our dialogue events bring together experts, community and faith leaders, and knowledge seekers to address social issues that affect us all. We feel dialogue is the most important element in peaceful coexistence, so we try and maintain several panel discussions, TED Talk events, and book clubs throughout the year. These events touch on social issues, race relations, and cultural understanding, and are a mainstay of our programming. The Atlantic Institute's education events are extremely important to our mission of understanding. We want to promote socially forward critical thinking to students of all ages. To that end, we have developed programs that seek to grow the creative spirit of students and help them think about their communities and the world around them. Our Future Leaders of Dialogue event brings together nominated elite students to learn from each other as well as political and business leaders. Our Art and Essay contest gives students a theme about important societal issues and allows them to create wonderful works of art and writing while steering their minds towards improving their world. We are always seeking ways to educate youths and adults in order to make a peaceful world for all of us. Our community events are designed to transform neighbors into friends and groups of people into a community. By associating with other nonprofits or by our own initiative, we are always trying to discover new avenues to improve our neighborhoods, places of worship, and community centers. We host cooking demonstrations of food from other cultures, work with various nonprofits to help elevate the work of others, and try to find a way to make the lives of those who are disenfranchised or marginalized better. Building a more peaceful world starts in our backyards, so we are dedicated to improving our communities and associations. The Atlantic Institute is always seeking like-minded volunteers and collaborators. If you would like to learn more, find volunteer opportunities, or just want to chat with our staff, please visit our website at www.AtlanticInstituteSC.org or follow us on Facebook. We will never run out of fun, educational, peaceful events. So come join us to help make this world a better place full of understanding and unity. Stop dive. All right. I want to thank everybody for coming and putting in your comments. And I am now going to turn this over to Natalie, who is going to show us how to make something with okra. Um, and I forgot what the exact name of it is, but she is going to let us know. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalie Copeland, and my business is Flavored Fork. I am here in uh, Lexington, South Carolina, which is just outside of Columbia, which is the capital city here in South Carolina. 
And um, I, the dish that I'm going to make today is called okra and tomato pilaf. Some people may say purloo, uh, but I like to say uh, pilaf, like rice pilaf, which is somewhat where this dish originates from. Uh, this is a specialty uh, low country dish down in Charleston in that area where I went to college. I myself personally am not a big fan of okra, but that doesn't mean just because I don't like something as much that I'm not going to cook it. Um, the ingredients and all seem to be very flavorful. Um, and okra is a favorite dish of my mother and also my husband. Uh, my mother used to fry okra, which is what this is, in case anyone has not seen and okra before I'm trying to get it to where it's not so um, so much sunlight coming through. But this is the okra. And she would fry these, usually cut them, I think, just cut the ends off and the tips off there. So you have about that much in the middle. And she would fry these down, if I'm not mistaken, in flour, salt and pepper probably, um, and then fry them in oil, like you would fry anything, you know, okra, uh, squash, piece of chicken, flat piece of chicken, something like that. And they were so tasty to her and to my husband. So then I figured I would learn how to fry okra. And I started doing my own spin on it by putting um, sliced onions in the oil. And my husband loved that because it made like little crunchy onion rings in there as well. So you don't have many dishes. I think as Paula was mentioning to me earlier, she hadn't seen many dishes that call for okra, and you really don't, as far as I know. Um, you got some gumbo, maybe. Um, there's a lot of dishes that come from the low country that would use okra and rice and tomatoes. Uh, I think there is, um, oh, what's it called? Succotash, I think, which is tomatoes and um, okra and corn. So you don't have many dishes, but this is a low country staple somewhat and also a low country specialty. So I'm just gonna show you what I got going on so far. I already have uh, a little bit of bacon grease in here. I've got my bacon already fried up. I'm gonna put that back to the side. I also added just a little bit of uh, bacon olive oil to this. So it wouldn't be all straight bacon grease. And then over here, I have started cutting up oops, my okra. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But I'm going to turn my pan up a little bit. And then I'm going to add in a red onion, which I have already diced up. I'm going to hold on that. But what I want to do while we're doing that is just show you, in case you have not seen this before, maybe what the inside of an okra would look like. So it's in the pod family, kind of like peas. So all it is is the shell here, and then you have your seeds, and then the flesh in here, kind of like a bell pepper somewhere. Like I said, it has a small top to it. You just usually cut that off. You don't cook that piece. It's kind of woody and stemmy on that part. Okay. And all I'm doing with the okra is I'm lopping off that top, cutting off that little stem at the bottom, and then I'm just slicing them into like what looks like little pinwheels, kind of. So they're looking like that. Right, and I have those sitting there. Right, my grease is warm. So I'll put my onions in. Spread them around. We're gonna let that cook just a little bit. Saute just a little bit, and fairly soft. And I'm gonna cut up this last piece of okra. Don't want to waste anything. Cut it a little bigger. The thing that I normally did not like about okra, and a lot of people don't like about okra, um, is usually the texture of it. When you have it like this and it is not too long out of the refrigerator, it's still very uh, sturdy and it holds its integrity well. 
But if it's been sitting out for a while, it tends to get very slimy. And that's usually what people don't like, is that it gets very slimy or very slick like. Uh, so that was usually what turned me off, to tell you the truth, about the okra. But if you get it when it's when it's still in the refrigerator or something, when it's still cold, slightly cold, and this hasn't become all slimy on, in, on the inside, that's much better for the texture and for uh, for eating to me, in my opinion. Now, if you're going to put it inside of a gumbo or a dish like that, it probably wouldn't even matter. But still, I like for it to be a little firm. Okay. Right, so I got all that cut. I'm going to put that right there. And a lot of things in Southern cooking, like I said, you saw that I used bacon grease. Um, a lot of things in Southern cooking, we, we're going to use bacon grease, things like that, because it gives added flavor to your dish as well. We're going to put a lot of butter in things. Um, with my business, Flavor Pork, I try to stick more on the healthier side and kind of redo some things that are not as heavy or doesn't contain as much animal fat. So I did use bacon grease here today, but I also use, like I said, a little bit of bacon olive oil as well. So you can half and half that, or you can just go straight olive oil if you'd like and omit the animal fat all together. I would say with this dish, not a whole lot to recreate uh, because that's about the only fat and thing that's in this dish. All right, so I got my onions going. I'm going to add my okra. And that was maybe uh, probably about, I'm going to say maybe about a pound, pound and a half of okra. And questions are coming through. I know Paula let me know if there are questions. I can't see that far. I didn't want to give in to bifocus with my glasses and I use them for driving. And I just, bifocus just made me feel old. And so I can I can see myself, I can see you all, but then I can't see the writing over there. I think I'm gonna have to just give they, up and get that. Sandra T says, my sister-in-law says she adds a little white vinegar when she adds okra to her gumbo. Have you heard of that before? I have not, I have not, but that's, that's a pretty good tip. Does that help uh, just with the acidity of it or does that keep it from being, uh, the okra from being as slimy? That would be good to know. We're just giving this a little toss, let that cook down just a little bit. Before I add in rice, rice, of course, is a big staple um, in the Charleston area. I was watching, um, what was a documentary type series on Netflix. I don't know if you all had seen it, called High on the Hall. And it was absolutely excellent. And I heard they were gonna do another season of it. Uh, but it pretty much took you through the travels of slaves all the way from Africa and all their stops in Charleston, parts of Virginia, um, just different areas. And it was very interesting, the foods. It was all about the foods that the Africans and the slaves used to cook. And um, they brought along with them uh, knowing how to grow and cook rice. And of course, one of the first stops in America was over in Charleston. And so they planted a lot of rice fields there and did a lot of cultivating the rice, did a lot of rice dishes of which this is one. There's the Carolina gold rice, uh, which is supposed to be very good, which is cultivated in Charleston. I have not had a chance to try that yet. But in this dish, you can use um, Carolina gold rice, or you can use uh, just some jasmine rice. You want a long grain rice is what you're looking for here. Jasmine rice is long grain, and of course it is a little fragrant. So that's adding to the flavor and the smell of your dish. A lot of what we do when we cook is based on presentation, what we see, what we smell before we actually get to eat. So, um... She said that it keeps the okra from being slimy. The vinegar Wonderful. does, yes. Wonderful. Um, and then I have, they're asking for a recipe and you're going to get that to me um, by Monday and I can email it to them, correct? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. All okay. right. 
And Sandra said something. Yes, that was a very interesting show. Hi on the hog. Yes, I am so looking forward to that. If, if I'm not mistaken, the guy who, who did the documentary, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he was from South Carolina, if I'm not mistaken. But it was so interesting. I didn't think I would like it at first, but it was so good. Um, the most interesting thing I found about it was when they talked about the difference between the sweet potatoes and the yams. And we you know, pretty much interchanged those here. You got a sweet potato, you got a yam, it's the same thing. And then when you saw what it was, actually, they're like, these are not the same at all around here. This is a sweet potato we have here. All right, so we've got these cooking. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start in the rice. And I have just a couple of rice. Stir that in together. Give it a quick stir. It's going to help it get a little toasty before we add the liquid. And that's just releasing more flavors, more aroma. And now we're going to add in the garlic. And no matter what the recipe says, I always do extra for the garlic. We love garlic here. Garlic is a very healthy ingredient as well. It's good for your blood pressure, your blood sugar. All right, so we got our garlic. Now we're gonna add tomatoes. And I just have some peeled and chopped tomatoes here. Now, one thing I would not do, I'm gonna let you know is I just use a can of the peeled uh, chopped tomatoes. I did not feel like <laughs> sitting and trying to peel tomatoes was something I wanted to do. So I took the shortcut instead, which is perfectly fine. Right, so now we've got that going. Okay. And then I'm gonna add in the broth. And for the broth, I have two cups of chicken broth. And this is actually the bone broth. This is the, uh, the brand that I used. And when I'm in the store, I take a lot of time because I'm diabetic, I take a lot of time reading the ingredients on the back. And because I'm also African-American, we need to try to keep down our sodium as much as possible. So I'm always looking on the back to see about the sodium content. And this Sam's Choice brand is a reduced sodium and also has no extra sugars. So this was the better one for me. You, of course, can use whatever kind you like. But a lot of times when they say reduced sodium, a lot of times they mean reduced sodium as compared to its, its same brand. So if it's a, a Campbell's, it's going to be compared to other Campbell's brands. So when you look at that, the, the original brand may have been 800 milligrams of sodium. And then compared to it, its low sodium brand was then 550, which is, of course, lower. But then you pick up a completely different brand, and it's only 380. And then you might find some that are lower than that. I'm big on reading labels now, big on reading labels. All right, so once I've got my broth in here, oops, hopefully not tearing up the kitchen, I'm going to turn this up just a bit and we're going to get it to a boil. And then I'm going to cover it and let it cook. Now that would normally be our, you know, slow time where we're going to let that cook. It's not going to take too long. Uh, it should take us about 20 minutes. Sandra, this, we yes, are recording this. It will be available on our Atlantic Institute YouTube channel, hopefully by Wednesday. So we don't, we don't, um, we have volunteers that load it up for us. So it hopefully will be done by Wednesday, but there are hundreds of other vi videos to watch there, including Natalie did one for us yesterday. We think it was a spaghetti squash dish, <laughs> um, but there are uh, three years, or this is our third year doing the cuisine of different cultures. So you can find lots out there to look at, but this one will be out there hopefully by Wednesday. 
All right, so this is coming to a boil now. Hopefully you can kind of see at least a little bit of that. So what I'm going to do during some of this downtime is give you another idea of what you can do instead of using the boxed or canned broth. We're going to cover this. Put that back down for a low here. And I'm going to let that cook for about 20 minutes. Turn my timer off because I'm, I'm really not good at keeping up with the time. And when this thing goes off, it is some sort of loud. When it first went off, after I first got it, we thought the smoke alarm was going off or something. It was so loud. All right, so what I want to show you now, of course, is another way you can uh, get chicken broth, beef broth, any kind of broth that you want. You could always make your own broth. So leave that at home. So basically what I'm going to do, and I'll put this on the oven. Uh, when you cook, if you have, say, chicken, for example, you can debone your chicken, save the bones, put them in a Ziploc bag, uh, onions. This is a good way to reduce food waste. If you're chopping an onion and you have just a little bit of that top part left, throw it in a bag. You keep all your vegetables, um, parts of leftover parts of green bell peppers, uh, maybe even jalapeno peppers, just different things before you throw it in the trash, put it in a bag. And I used to keep like a bag of say chicken bones, uh, sometimes some of the skin of the chicken and keep that in a bag. And it might be another bag with beef bones and another bag just of a bunch of vegetables, celery, anything like that. So what you wanna do is simply add some water. More. And once you make your own broth, then you can freeze it into a big container or just individual, uh, like eight ounce containers, something like that. So I've just got a little bit of water here and I'm gonna get some. So I haven't been doing as much collecting as I normally do, but I did have a bag that I was starting the last time I put a uh, pork shoulder. So I do have, I do kept, I kept the bones and just a little bit of the meat there from the pork shoulder, another bone. I like using the bones for the broth because the bones hold a lot of flavor. Put a little more water in that, cover up that bone. I want to make sure everything is covered. And then, I would just hang it onto a bag of vegetables. So I was thinking I have in here like some mushrooms. I think that is some eggplant. I don't want to use eggplant. And so I'm going to put some of those in here. And like I say, they've got a lot of ice on them, but you don't want to put them in a a bag like your press and seal type bags that suck all the air out because you're going to just keep adding to this bag. So when you finish cooking like each particular meal, then you want to go in there and get your bag, add to it. So you're going to keep going in and out of it. So no sense in doing the whole, um, you know, sealing the bag, taking all the air out. Unless you figure you have finally filled it up as much as you want, then you can take it out and put it in that kind of bag. I'm just going to put a few more of these vegetables in here. I've got some red onions there. I've got some bell, red bell peppers. And then if I want to, I can add some more vegetables. I can add some fresher vegetables in with that. Uh, some herbs, for example. So with this, you could get a little creative. So I think I am going to add, of course, some salt and pepper.
and I want to add some time. Seasonings, of course, you can use whatever kind of seasonings you like, whatever you think that you prefer the most. So this is an onion and herb seasoning. It's salt free. You can play around with any kind of seasonings you'd like. I'm gonna take the top off of that. And I'm just gonna sprinkle. And I wanna sprinkle liberally because I want this to have some flavor. And then I wanna add some thyme. That's probably about, I would say a teaspoon. Put that in. I like adding thyme and rosemary uh, to my dishes. And then this is what I use when I need uh, salt and pepper. This is seasonella bologna aromatic herbal salt. I can't wait to see how the closed captioning is going to put that, <laughs> but what I'm saying. Uh, but this has salt, pepper, like garlic powder, onion powder, uh, sage, rosemary, a lot of seasonings in it. And it's uh, very coarse, so you don't have to use a lot of it when you're cooking. So I'm just gonna sprinkle some of that. And that helps keep my sodium content down as well. I'm gonna put this on the water, put this on the heat here. And I'm gonna put these back. And if there's any other seasoning that you like, that you would prefer, um, rosemary, uh, cardamom, uh, marjoram, some of those, garam masala, that would probably be good. You can put any of those seasonings in there that you like. Uh, so celery seed or celery is always good in a broth as well. And I do believe, yes, I have celery seed. And I'm doing about the same thing, probably about a teaspoon of that. If you have actual celery, of course, you can use that instead. And then my favorite thing to add would be garlic. Mm -hmm. Always love garlic. All right, if there's anything else you want to add, uh, like today we'll be using basil. You can always put basil in there. A lot of people like to put bay leaves and things. You can put, put that in there as well. But for right now, that's all I'm going to use is because I'm just trying to show you how to get this going. And so now you have everything in your pot. I've got enough water to basically just cover the bones and the vegetables there. And then we're going to bring it to a boil and then you'll cover that and turn your heat down. And then you're just going to let that simmer and cook. You might want to let it cook for at least an hour just to get all the flavors to come together. And then once it cools down, if there's any fat that has come on top once it cools, you can actually skim that off the top. You can just uh, get a spoon, a fork, knife or something, and just cut that off and dump that out. And then all you're left with is just the broth. And then put it in eight ounce containers, put it in a big container, depends on how you like to cook. Uh, small four to eight ounce containers would probably be best because that's probably about as much as you're gonna use is at least eight ounces in a recipe. So we'll let that come to a boil. And then like I said, give that a cup. Has anyone out there ever made their own broth? If you haven't, it's something you should try. You can always Google just, uh, you know, DIY um, uh, broth, chicken broth, vegetable broth. You can put carrots also in there, like some many kinds of vegetables, and just skip the bones all together, just the water and your vegetables and a lot of seasonings. You could also make a bouquet of seasoning with a uh, cheesecloth and just put a lot of herbs and say lemon, sliced lemons and oranges and stuff in it and put that in your uh, broth as well. This broth turns out to be whatever you want it to be and it may not be the same thing twice. 
because it's going to depend on what you have been cooking and what you have been saving in that bag in the freezer. And like I said, that's a good way to reduce food waste. So you're not wasting anything. It just goes in the bag and gets reused later on. And fresh is always best. So better to make your own than to have to depend on the ones from the store. And this you control the salt and the sodium that goes in your food. Do we have any additional questions yet, Paula? Nope. nope. We had nope. one person say yes, they had made broth before, but <laughs> but yeah, no, have... nothing else that 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 we need, just the recipe. Um, the other is about closed captioning stuff. So I'm I'm handling that part, but okay. We're, we are good. Anybody got questions while we're waiting for this to cook a little bit? Nope. And, and I tell you, if you want to experiment and make this dish your own, uh, shrimp, of course, is very popular in Charleston. Um, you know, of course, they do a lot of shrimping down in that area, shrimping and crabbing and that kind of thing. So if you want to, you can also add shrimp to this dish. Um, you could even, I would say, poach some chicken. And then that would make your stock, your broth that you would use in this and then shred that chicken and include that in this dish right when it's done and you're fluffing up your rice. So that's another option as well. You can always add meat to it if you want to. Sausage would be good as well. Like I said, this is to the traditional way, um, but shrimp is usually the first thing they think about adding to this dish simply because, like I said, it's low country and that's shrimp are big in Charleston. Seafood is huge. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see people are still coming in. That's good. That's good. While I am waiting, I'll tell you something else. Let me go ahead and get my... I'm going to go ahead and chop up my bacon and my basil. So that when it is done, I am done. Right, so I'm going to go ahead and chop some basil up. Um, you can use uh, parsley or thyme or a mixture of these if you'd like. Uh, you can use fresh or you can use dried. I'm just using fresh basil today. That would be a nice addition to the dish. I'm going to cut these up so that when this is finished, I will sprinkle that on top. And I'm just gonna take these last couple of basil leaves and drop them right there in my bra. Last little pieces here. And it's already starting to smell delicious in here. All right. So now I've got basil. That smells good. Basil is chopped and ready. And the next thing I will also need ready will be my bacon. I'm going to go ahead and give that a chop too. And this is just a rough chop. It doesn't have to be, you know, super diced or anything. Edible slices, not big chunks, I will say that. And this was about, I think it was six slices of bacon that I used. And again, if you don't like bacon or you don't want bacon, you don't have to use bacon. Um, if you're trying to maybe use a bacon substitute, you can. You can always use turkey bacon. Um, the only thing with turkey bacon is turkey bacon, of course, doesn't quite give you that same amount of flavor that you get from regular pork bacon. So uh, that would be my only admonishment is that, you know, you're going to lose some of that flavor. But 
it will still have the texture. So if that's what you want, and you're not too concerned about the bacon and flavor, or that's a, not, you know, if that's against your religion, then of course, you know, you can skip that. Have the meat on my hands and get my hands quick wash. All right, now my broth is coming to a boil there. I'm just going to cover that and turn it down now. And I'm just going to let that cook. That'll cook for another hour or so here. And we only have about five minutes left for our dish. Now, as I mentioned, I went, I, I think I did, that I went to school down in Charleston. I'm from, actually from a little town called Darlington, South Carolina. I don't know if any of you know of it. Um, if you've ever heard of the Southern 500 races, that is us. It's pretty much what puts us on the map. Um, and I went to school, like I said, in Charleston for four, four years down there at the College of Charleston for two and at the Medical University of South Carolina for the last two. And Charleston food, I will say, is absolutely delicious. Low country cooking is one of my favorite uh, things to do and to consume. Uh, like I said, I'm not real big on the okra, but all the shrimp, the crab, the fish, even the rice dishes, even though I try not to eat too much rice, uh, all of those dishes with the tomatoes, they cook with a lot of flavor, a lot of soul, a lot of, of love there from that Charleston area. It's a different kind of flavor and seasoning that they do. Where all the seasonings from your cast iron skillets, they just accumulate. And so it's almost like no dish tastes the same because it is made from all the dishes that have come before it. It's just a, it's a different thing. It is an entirely different thing. And as African Americans and the slaves, when they were cooking, they learned how to make with less than. So some of the foods that uh, the owners may have been throwing away or casting aside, they actually learned how to make great dishes from things like pig's feet, or pig ears, and um, other parts, intestines of hogs. Don't get me started on those things. Uh, but uh, it, it shows you how resilient people as a whole can be. And some of these dishes, you work with what you have. And that's what I'm saying even about the broth. You work with what you have. So it's, it doesn't have to be the same every time. You don't have to do the same recipe. You don't even have to measure things. You're making it from what you have left over and making that your own. And then you incorporate it maybe into another recipe. And it's got your own spin, your own flavor built into it. It's a wonderful thing. I'm going to get off my soapbox on that, but that is the one thing I have learned about cooking. I follow recipes so I know exactly what it's supposed to taste like, and then when I make it again, I start putting my own spin on it, because, and then I know how close to the original I came, especially when I'm trying to redo them into healthier dishes. Uh, the only thing I would change with this, like I said, is maybe not use the bacon, use uh, bacon olive oil or just regular olive oil, a garlic flavored olive oil, something like that. And maybe not rice, uh, you could actually use cauliflower rice, something like that. And then it wouldn't have to cook as long. It would be done even faster because that's going to cook pretty quickly. So those would be my only two things. There is a, um, a cauliflower rice, I can't remember the brand, but it comes in a box made by Yang Tong, and it cooks and looks more like rice grains. So it would take a little longer to cook, um, maybe not as long as the jasmine rice, but it would take a little longer to cook and would have that same look and texture. I used that uh, not so long ago making chicken ball, which is another South Carolina uh, staple. Even though some people didn't know what I was saying when I said chicken ball, B-O-G. Uh, some people just call it chicken and rice. But it's essentially the same thing, celery and onions and rice and chicken uh, and chicken broth. Uh, you just mix all these things up together. And instead of rice, I used the cauliflower rice that came in the box. So it had more texture uh, to it, a little more integrity. 
and look closer to actual rice. And it was absolutely delicious and people had no idea that they were eating coffee. All right, so we got, oh, we're down to seconds now. Let me get this off. We'll see what we got. That is looking good. It is, <laughs> it is looking good and it is smelling good, I will say. I wish I wish we had, you know, the ability to smell through the TV screen as well or the computer. Yes. Oh, there's that front one. That thing is loud. And then now what we're gonna do is just let it sit there. It's got to sit for a little bit. Uh, just to keep helping the rice to absorb some of that water. And then we will be able to eat it and also serve it with our uh, bacon and a little bit of basil, which she likes to smell so good here, which I'm gonna get a bowl for that. I will be ready, ready, ready. Um, I have one person asking, why take an hour to cook broth? Well, what is basic, what you basically want to do is you want to cook it on low. So you want it to have time for all of your seasonings to blend and marry together. You don't really want to rush that broth. You want to have time for that to really cook down and cook through. That's the main thing. It's like making um, red sauce for Italians. Uh, my neighbor is Italian and she makes the red sauce and sometimes they cook that thing eight whole hours. The longer you cook it, the more the flavor intensifies. And that's what you want when you're doing your broth. Now, if you're in a hurry and you want to do it faster, you can always do that. But flavor is the key. So just put it all low and walk away from it. And, and that versus just buying the store bought is you know what's going into it and you can um, counteract the, the sodium like you are talking about, um, exactly. which is awesome for those of us who have really high blood pressures exactly. is to, to do that kind of thing. And how long would the broth keep in the refrigerator and or the freezer so you could use it, you know, if you make a big batch? Well, I think in the refrigerator, it may keep uh, probably over a week, maybe two at the most. Normally, when I take mine out, I'll go ahead and put it into probably two decent sized containers and put it right in the freezer. And I have pulled it out of the freezer like the next week. And then some I pulled it out in the next month and it's still been fine. All right. Mm -hmm. And I love that even when you cook, um, oh, like anytime you're cooking chicken, if you're poaching chicken, save that broth, save the juice out of that, and put it in a container and let it sit in the refrigerator first so they can harden up any fat that's on top, skim that off and put it back in that freezer. That way you're killing two birds with one stone. You're making your broth and you're going to have folks to eat it. I know this is probably bad to say, but for sometimes I buy canned chicken if I want something quick. And I even save that, that juice because it, it's been sitting in that water. The chicken's been sitting in that water gathering you know the water's gathering that chicken flavor and so I even save that and then pull it out of the freezer and use it later on when I need a little chicken broth or stock and that way you know I'm not buying it as well exactly. now that usually doesn't have anything but the chicken flavor in it so you uh, I would then add spices and and seasoning to make it what I want but and that's a small a, a small amount so it would almost yeah. be like using a little bouillon cube and then you add more water to it. So it's basically yes. the same thing. Right? Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. um, my, my mom and my grandma are very old school and they can chicken um, the old school with the canning methods. Um, yes, they are, they, they'll they buy like chicken in bulk when it goes on sale and freeze it. And then when they feel the need to can it, they'll just sit down and can chicken all day long. And they keep the, the broth they make that they put it in uh, very generic so that you can use it in any kind of dish that you need. 
Yes. And when I used to live in Michigan with them, they would give it to us like as Christmas presents, us grandkids and stuff, because it was, it's like gold, like, you know, it's like, it's not the same as what you get in the stores. It's better, you know, and exactly. better for you kind of, because it does have that less sodium, but yes, that's, I haven't had that in years. It's kind of. <laughs> it's not that like, like prepping foods and having things prepared and saved up for later, saves you time later on. And again, it helps you to know what you're putting in your body. Yes. You control that, which is yeah. always the way you want to go. Yes, they can, they can everything. They can, they make the chicken, vegetables, to, tomatoes, and they do tomatoes like chunk tomatoes or tomato sauce or like they do soups, they do um, this pepper relish thing. And then um, one of the other things they do is uh, my grandmother has horseradish plants. And so they do horseradish. Um, but I think that's one of those, those that you harvest, I think it's like every other year or something like that. And so every other year they harvest horseradish and there is nothing like homemade harvested horseradish compared to the store-bought stuff. So but I love living here in South Carolina and I won't move back to Michigan. I do miss that those homemade things that that they did for us. So mm -hmm. yes. I haven't gotten into canning, but my husband keeps saying he wants to start learning how to can some things. So I'm sure it's it's coming eventually. <laughs> it's coming. It, it is. I have helped them a few times, and it is a like, like I said, when they do chicken, they do mass amounts of chicken. Like, I want to say 25 to 50 jars of it. Oh, Lord. Yeah, they do. They well, they do mass amounts. And so it's like an all day affair with them. And then afterwards, they do not go out. They get they go out to dinner. They they just they go out to dinner. They've been cooking all day, so to speak. And they do not eat chicken. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that's smart. OK, you go out to dinner after. I, I'll give you that. I give you that. That's a long that's what I think I'm like, that's a long process. Yeah. And in order for me to get to that, I have to find time where I even have an entire day left to be yes. able to do that. Yes. So. Yeah. Cause yeah, like I said, they do lots. They they bo basically boil the chicken off to where you can pull it off the bones. Cause they mm -hmm. just they take it off the bones and everything. And all you're getting is that good chicken meat and then the broth that they've cooked it in. And yep. So it's, it is, it, it is very time consuming and um, very, but it's good. It's so good and so worth it. <laughs> I was going to say, it helps when you have things already, already done. Yes. We could do that like on Sundays, I may cook two dishes and then prep another, or my husband gets a big uh, box of chicken breasts. He had one time, we had probably like 30 pounds of chicken in here. And we just sat and sliced them because the breast was so big, you could slice yeah. them in half mm -hmm. and then slice them again. So one breast made like four pieces of chicken about the size of my hand. Oh my. We went ahead and just seasoned them some with just salt and pepper. Some I did with Italian seasoning. Some we did with Cajun seasoning. And then we put them all in bags, labeled them, and then put them in the freezer. So when we were, and then some I just left plain. Yeah. So whenever we were ready, depending on what kind of recipe I wanted, what kind of flavor I was interested in, Spill out the bag with the Italian seasoning, which I just used, and I uh, made a chicken marsala with that. It already had my Italian seasonings already on it. That saved me some time. Got my mushrooms and everything else going. Next thing I know, dinner was done. Yep. Yes, the vet, having that canned component like that is, um, you know, because then, you like you said, the chicken part is done, and you pull it out, and you, you mm -hmm. may warm it up, or, um, you know, we've used, we make, like, chicken salad, like, mayonnaise kind of chicken salad with it um soups or you know italian dishes or whatever it it, it is awesome to just do that um that the next best favorite. thing i've found to that is when you go to the store and buy those chickens that have been um roasted all day or not yeah. all day but they roast the chickens that mm -hmm. is like the equivalent for me to to getting that canned chicken from them so yes. and that is another good idea I love going there and getting those uh, rotisserie chickens. Rotisserie. Sometimes I buy two or three at a time and I would just put them in the deep freezer. Yep. And then when I needed a chicken just as whole or it called for roasted chicken, get it out, pull the skin off, slice it up, like I said, make my chicken salad, any of my dishes. I didn't have to worry about cooking. 
already done. Yep. Have to find ways to save time sometimes. Yes, ma'am. We are now a busy, very busy society and you do have to find ways, but to bring in still that good flavor of meals and stuff, so. Yes. How are we doing? All right, we are looking good. And you can cook this in a sauce pot. I wanted to just use a bigger pot just to let things kind of spread out. But normally, um, I'm gonna go ahead and just wrap it up. Um, it would probably cook, should cook, looks like a little bit longer just so it can firm up and then put it in your bowl and with your seasonings. But I'm gonna show you what it looks like because I don't wanna keep you all here too long, standing here listening to me. Like I said, I know my husband's gonna love this because this is his kind of favorite thing, tomatoes. And he's got fresh okra. And he's got rice, his favorite things. <laughs> so, and we're gonna put a little bit. Let's oh, gonna add just a little bit of bacon on top. Bacon makes everything better. Okay. Um, just a little bit of the basil on top. And so basically, this is your dish. You can see that. So, is that coming through good? Yeah. Yes. So, and it's like I said, it smells divine. I'm just going to mix those up. I'm going to look for a piece of the, of the bacon because, like I said, I'm not real big on okra, but I am going to eat these. And the thing I like about this dish is that the okra still has a lot of integrity to it. So it's not, um, it's not slimy at all. Still tastes very fresh. Along with the tomato, you get a lot of that flavor in there. And then you got your fragrant rice. And of course, like I said, if you add basil, it adds even more flavor um, to the dish as well. But like I said, you can always, of course, then cook you some shrimp, uh, just saute them, and then put that in that dish. Or if you have some chicken, rotisserie chicken, you can add that. I would put it in the pot, you know, maybe close to the end so that some of that chicken flavor continues to seep through to the rice. Um, and then your chicken is absorbing some of the other flavors as well. You don't want it to taste just like, I just plop chicken right on top. Cut the chicken up in pieces and then put it in there and let it cook for a while. Same with the shrimp. I would kind of par cook that a little bit and then add it into this dish and let it cook. You don't want to cook shrimp too long or it's going to get kind of rubbery, but I would want it in there long enough to absorb the flavors and you don't want to put the shrimp in raw. So let it cook just as, like a hair, a minute or so, and then throw it in there and let it get the rest of that flavor. And then like I said, you've got bacon, you've got fresh tomatoes, you've got onions, I mean, as, as someone I once heard say, what's not to like? That is your okra and tomato pilaf, a low country specialty. Thank you, Natalie. Anybody have any questions? Ooh. Ooh. All right, again, if you are interested in seeing in the, this video later on, it will be on the Atlantic Institute SC YouTube channel, you just type that in and you will find us. Or if you get into YouTube, you type in Atlantic Institute SC, make sure you get that South Carolina or, or SC in there. Um, and you will find the, the video that Natalie did last time as well as lots of other videos. I just found out that they are captioned. Um, you have to push the little caption button, but you can watch the videos and caption if you need. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for coming and this was wonderful. I am going to stop the recording now. And if anybody has any questions, we'll be here for a couple more minutes. Have a great day. Thank you all.